Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So you heard me talk about Caregiver Chronicles in advertisements on previous episodes. And today we have Dr. Yvette Jackson on to tell us all about Caregiver Chronicles. So thanks so much for joining me, Yvette. Thank you for having me, Ms. Fink. I appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to share this important information. I have learned so much from guests. Unfortunately, I didn't learn it soon enough. So that is one of my biggest messages is the more you learn and the earlier you get this information into your head and into your life practices, the easier your caregiving journey is going to be. And caregiving journeys are not easy. So let's do everything we can to make them better. Right, right. That's right. So tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Okay, so um, just to go into my uh, history of Caregiver Chronicles or prior to there too, um, my mother had Alzheimer's disease and I was her caregiver for nine years. And so during that time, I learned every aspect of caregiving from the onset of her illness until she actually, well, until she transitioned because I actually went through that entire process with her for nine years. Um, my mother was, well, I was a single parent at the time. Um, I was working a full-time job at that time as well. Um, I had three sons that uh, were vastly becoming teenagers. Um, and then I had a, uh, my mother and I was working, I was actually going to school full-time at USC working on my master's in social work. And so I had all of these areas of responsibility that uh, consumed my time as well as being a caregiver for my mother who was diagnosed with dementia. And then the Alzheimer's, of course, uh, you know, it transitioned to Alzheimer's and, uh, you know, progressed on from there. Um, And so, but it was a great learning experience uh, because it taught me everything about caregiving. Um, It taught me, you know, what, what happens when you are a caregiver. And I was just like most of you, Um, I learned from scratch because I was thrown into the water basically to swim. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, when I realized that I had to take on this responsibility, I was actually living somewhere else. I had to uproot my family Mm -hmm. to my mother's home, take care of her and my three sons, had to redo her home so it would be habitable for us to live in. um, And then had to take on the responsibility of her as, you know, being Basically, she was my daughter as well. Um, you know, I had, it was a mind transition for me as well. Um, I had to realize that uh, I was no longer her daughter uh, cognitively, even though biologically I was. I had to realize that I was now her mother in perspective. And so I, I made that transition. And it was it was funny, though, uh, um, Jennifer, I want to tell you that uh, while I was going to school at USC, I was actually living what I was learning. And so that made it a lot easier for me. Um, It allowed me to know what the stressors are. It allowed me to know what to expect in some aspects. And so it was really a great experience. It it really taught me a lot. And so what mom did was she left me Caregiver Chronicles. And so that's, that's how I got to this point. And now I'm at a point where in my life where I want to share this information with others so that they will know what to do because many people who uh, are thrown into the caregiver arena do not have an idea as to what to do. And I was one of those people because I lived it. So yeah, I'd like to share my information with others. I consider caregiving, especially since many of us are thrust into the caregiving role in an emergency, it's kind of like quicksand at first, like with my mom, she would chat with clients, take orders, no directions, no due dates, nothing useful whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I learned really quickly that if I just, if I heard her chatting to somebody, Mm -hmm. if I went out to the front and said, you know, of our shop and, and said, Oh, so uh, what, what are we doing for Yvette today? Uh I could insert myself into the conversation. I hope kind of grace gracefully and allow her dignity of, you know, not having to, not having me to have to call people and say, oh my gosh, my mom didn't write any directions. Cause that's not really a good, something you want to do with clients anyway. Right. My right. Dad did most of the caregiving. He wasn't, he wasn't, well, he needed to learn a lot more too, but 
Mm -hmm. He wasn't really open to my sister and I helping. And so when he got sick and was in the hospital for a month, uh -huh. yikes, what a disaster that was. Oh, <laughs> wow. We were dealing with his crisis and her, you know, her advanced Alzheimer's and their dog. And it was just like, yipes. And, right. you know, then he was on hospice and then he passed away. Okay. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, we never discussed what we were going to do with my mom. He assumed she'd come live with me. My mm -hmm. daughter literally moved out a month before he passed away. So mm. the fact that he just assumed I had even a room for her, which prior to his passing, I did not. Right. It right. Just, it was, it still upsets me. Cause it's like, that's a very giant assumption to make of a family member without ever having a conversation. And so people have heard that story a lot. Right. And, right. And I'm hoping we're recording this the day after Thanksgiving. I'm yeah. hoping people via Zoom or whatever, I'm hoping they had some conversations yesterday about, you know, what your end of life desires are, what you, you know, what you want. Like my mom wanted to live in her home forever and ever and not be a burden on my sister and I. Okay. Okay. That's mutually exclusive. So right. had we had a conversation at least with my dad or very early on with my mom, my mom had Alzheimer's for about 20 years. We had a long time to discuss things, but we also had a long time to ignore problems. So that wasn't very right, helpful. Right. So nine years is a long journey as well. But yeah, caregiving, you end up thrust into it. It's usually in an emergency or you take it on and you think, oh, this is, I can handle this. And the next thing you know, you're up to your neck in quicksand going, help, what do I do? And right. Well, so, you don't really know when you start the caregiver journey. You don't exactly. know what to expect because, first of all, you don't know what the course of the disease or the illness, whatever the illness might be. It doesn't necessarily have to be Alzheimer's. Whatever that illness is, you don't know what the course is. Are they going to recover? Are they going to transition home, you know, to be with the Lord from that? And so it's really a touch and go situation because you're feeling your way as you go. Um, but I thought about what you said, and it's important that you have these conversations with your family member, that uh, parents have their conversations with the children so they will know what your wishes are. And it's also important that the children have a conversation amongst themselves and the entire family so that everyone is on the same page when it comes down to it, because family dynamics is a whole new beast when yeah. you are dealing with caregiving. And so, and I lived that as well. So I won't even leave, I won't leave that out. Uh, <laughs> but I won't, I will say that it's a whole new world when you have a family member that's ill, because there's always going to be that one family member, that one child, if you will, that's going to step up to the plate and take care of that parent a hundred percent. Some of them may come and go. They may come by and see mom. They may come by and check on dad or mom. But there's going to be one that will do the actual uh, nine to five or 24 hour, if you will, caregiving job. And so it's really important that you have these conversations. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the first place that people can access information from you, you do a live Facebook chat every Friday. Yes. And matter of fact, we have one tonight. Uh, we are going to be, and this is National Caregiver Month, uh, November is. And so tonight we are going to be paying homage to those who are caregivers, who have been caregivers. I have a guest that's coming on that is a caregiver for his mother. And there are men caregivers too. And these are two men that's going to be with us tonight. It's going to be really interesting. And then there's one gentleman who's going to be joining us as well. And his, he was a caregiver for his wife and she recently transitioned. And, and then we have another person, a, a cohort of mine from USC. She's going to be joining us tonight. Um, and so it's going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, but I think that paying homage to the caregivers is really important because as caregivers, you are very much overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't understand what your plight is. They don't understand the magnitude of being a caregiver for 24 seven. Um, and so I can't even imagine having done what I did for 20 years as you, uh, Jennifer, I really don't. When you say 20, I think uh, when I say nine years, I think nine years is such a long time. But when you tell me 20, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's twice as long as, you know, as my caregiver experience. So it's just, it's, it's just unreal. You know, yeah, I always joked because I was, 
Well, I still participate in my Alzheimer's caregiver support group. I uh-huh. missed October and I got text messages and emails. I got chastised. I'm like, I'm sorry. I was out walking the dogs. And I realized, oops. And it's right. a zoom call. So I could have joined in, but I'm like, you know what? I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't need it, but they wanted me. So I still participate. Right. And I always joked that I was usually the youngest caregiver who had the loved one with the longest journey of the disease. So I'm like, yay, I win. (laughs) Right. You do. Because I'm telling you, I don't hear too many people say 20 years. Uh, Now I hear less than nine. I've rarely heard more than nine years. Um, And so you saying 20 years, I can't even imagine that. And so you are a blessing. You are a blessing to your parents, even though it was stressful for you. Um, I can say that the beauty of my experience was that mom was a very gentle and sweet person because that helped me to get through it because I can, I've heard some stories about family members who, you know, have taken care of loved ones who were very aggressive Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe even combative, if you will. Um, And so that was the beauty. The, the, I was lucky in that aspect. I was blessed in that aspect because she wasn't, but she had one day and I'll share this with you all one day where she got uh, upset. I took her to the adult daycare and they tried to take her purse and she (laughs) did not want to give that purse up. And so she hit the daycare person with her cane. And so I got a call. I'm at work and I'm like, okay, then you got to come and get her. She's, you know, she's acting up. She's acting up. She's, you know, she's hit us with the cane. I said, okay, I'm on my way. So I leave work. I go to get her. And um, when I get there, they were trying to take her purse and she didn't want them to. And so I realized at that point, she had to have that purse every day. And that purse, even though it was empty, she had to have it. And so I made sure that she had that purse and they never bothered her. They let her keep it because, you know, she didn't have nothing in it anyway. And so that was the only one day that she was aggressive. But I have heard some stories about people who have had their loved ones that were very aggressive during that time. And so I thank God for that, um, Jennifer. I really do. Cause I don't know if I'd have been able to get through it. I really don't. My mom was getting combative at the end okay. and she, she didn't, well, I think she swung her purse at one of the paid caregivers in the residence she lived in. That would have been about nine or so months before she passed away. Okay. She, my, my husband's last interaction with her, she, she was big on scratching. She'd grab your arm and just, and she would do, she drew blood on him. She'd drawn blood on caregivers. It was not pretty. I'm but sure. I have, I have a funny purse story. My mom carried her purse around too. <laughs> For a while it had like a wallet in it and it would, cause we, I would always take her out and we'd go, you know, visit or we'd do an errand for her, you know, get her personal needs. And she always stressed if she didn't have money. Half the time I tried to like stick my own money in there so that she could pay. And then I could just take the money back out of the ATM with the right. her debit card. <laughs> but that purse, I think was as old as my daughter who just turned 29. Okay. It was dirty and gross. Right. And it was like, if I could f- find a purse that looked exactly the same, that was clean, I would have. Uh-huh. But at the end Hers wasn't empty. Hers had, she would unroll about four feet of toilet paper and fold it up. And oh my gosh, she'd stuff that paper everywhere. But her purse, it was, I have a photo that I share sometimes on social media where literally her purse had one fuzzy sock and just like a pandemic's worth of toilet paper. (laughs) Not that she'd probably (laughs) want to use it. (laughs) But so it was kind of a joke after, you know, this whole crazy year with, the, you know, with the whole toilet paper issue. Right, uh, right. She um, was I, well, I lost my train of thought when we cleaned out her room. Uh-huh. My husband's like, here's her purse. Do you want it? I'm like, no, I'd really like to burn it. But I'm pretty sure it's like, you know, faux. It's not any, it's not like le- leather, which I don't know if leather burns. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> haven't torched too many things in my life, but I was just like, no, I'll be very happy to throw this nasty thing away. She'd right, stopped right. carrying it around, but there were so many of the women in the care residence she lived in. They just walk around with their purse over their arm and their hand over the handle. And they just wander. <laughs> right. <laughs> like- but see, they were used to that. You, the one thing I can tell those who are listening 
is that you need to keep as much familiarity with them as you can, especially with dementia and Alzheimer's. Because once you take that familiarity away from them, and that when I say familiarity, just, just let understand that things that they're used to, things that they used to do all the time, consistency is what they need. Because if you take that consistency away from them, it really takes them on a downturn. And I, I'll share that with you too, if, if I may. Um, my mother, uh, well, we lived in a house uh, in a certain area and ha having three sons that were vastly becoming teenagers um, in that home, we lived next door to a crack house. Oh, know, dear. To be honest. And so uh, my kids were vastly becoming adults, you know, young adults, teenagers at that vulnerable stage. And I was like, oh, no, we got to, you know, I got to make a decision because I knew if I moved mama out of the house, it was going to be bad for her because she would, you know, be in a new environment and it wouldn't be good. But then I also had to save my sons, too. And so I had to make a difficult decision to move her out, of, move us out of that house. And so what I did was I did I moved, moved us out of there and we went to a new residence and purchased a new home. And when we did mom immediately stopped walking mm. and she stopped eating. And I was like, oh my goodness. You know, I called the doctor. I said, doctor, she's some, you know, she's not eating. She's not walking. You know, what's going on? So he sent physical therapy. Home health came out. They started working with her and they got her walking again. But see, I had changed her living environment and she had been in that house since I was a baby. I grew up in that house. And so she knew that house. And so at that point I was like, okay, you know, we're okay now. She's walking again. She's eating again monitoring her closely, you know, to see what she's going to do. And then it got to a point where I said, well, I'm going to sleep in the room with her. So if I, if she gets up at night, I'll know, I'll know what she's doing. I sleep, I got this big old king size bed. I slept in the bed with her. And then she got up in the middle of the night one night trying to get to the laboratory, which is the bathroom. And uh, <laughs> she ended up in the closet trying to get into the bathroom. And I said, oh my goodness, this is not working. So I called the doctor again. I said, doctor, something's going on. You know, I said, what are we going to do? Mom's getting up in the middle of the night. I can't sleep. I'm going to school. I'm working. I got three sons that are teenagers. You got to do something. Okay. And so what he said was, okay, we'll send everything to the house. So that next day, all the equipment came, the hospital bed, the commode, walker, wheelchair, everything she needed came to the house which was a blessing. And so at that point, I was able to maneuver a little better. So I wanted to just mention to those who are listening in, if you move your loved one out of their environment, or if you take away their familiar things that they do, it can have a profound effect on them. And that's for dementia or Alzheimer's. There are other ailments that may not, it may not be like that, but for the dementia and Alzheimer's, you know, that is a, a, a concern that you want to always take into consideration. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that to your audience. One of the things I tell people, I just had a conversation recently with a, a gal in my support group. She's 80, her husband's 85, you know, she's tired and she's looking for alternatives to him being at home. And of course they're very expensive. And one of the things I tell people is if you are if you are actively thinking, is it time? It's probably past time. Right. My mom was in the early stages of the advanced stage, if that makes sense. Right, right. And when my dad passed away and because my sister is four and a half years younger and I had just turned 50 and we all worked, I'm like, yes, yeah, she's not coming living with me because that would last about a week and then one of us would be dead. But okay. it took her about six or seven weeks to acclimate to where she, her new living situation, because okay. she'd been in her house jet, like literally two months shy of 47 years. Right. And it was ugly. I would show up, I'd knock on her door. Cause I'd always go after lunch and she'd open the door and burst into tears and wail and cry. And it was like, oh. this place can't possibly be that badly. <laughs> oh no! And when she finally acclimated, you would have thought that somebody had said, Hey, Jen, you just won the jumbo lotto because it was the best day when, you know, it's like she'd forgotten all about her home. Yeah. It was interesting because the, the care community was across the street from a middle school Okay. Their, my family home or childhood home 
was across the street from an elementary school. Now she couldn't really see the school, but I could refer to it and not feel like I was living in an alternative universe, which with her, as you know, is already what we're doing. Right, right. Kids would come from the middle school and do projects and activities with um, the residents of the assisted living part of the community. And mm -hmm. they would bring over some of the memory care residents, the ones that could, could do the, the activities or would benefit from at least the social interaction. So it was really nice. Okay. And it was a, it was a great place, but you know, it, yeah. it, it took her a long time and it, you know, they're not cheap, but they do everything pretty much. They don't shop. You know, I would show up and visit, we'd go out and we'd go watch kids at the park or whatever we'd do. And I'd show up, I'd take her back and they'd be like, Oh, your mom needs more toilet paper. She needs more. I'm like, couldn't have told me that when I was already leaving the first time. Cause this is the, this is the going home exit. And I was always afraid, like I would bring the stuff back and hand it to them and not go into the residence because I knew if she saw me, then I'd have to do a whole other visit all over again. Cause she right, right. Know I'd been there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's, yeah, you, know, you oh. learn all these little tricks and just because your loved one is in a residence does not mean that your caregiving responsibilities go away they that's just right. change that's right and they change more so you have to be more proactive as as far as being there and knowing what's going on with her or your or him or whomever your loved one is um, because you can put your loved one in a facility and just kind of feel like oh she's fine the facility staff have her but let me tell you this you need to monitor what's going on at that facility especially with covid um, now, you know, they might not let you in there either. So you need to really figure out a way to know what's going on with your loved one, because there can be a breakdown with the care of your loved one. If you're not careful, that's important. And remember that all of you guys are a team. One of the things that I noticed early on in my mom living where she did yeah. was there were some family members that were just bossy and demanding. And I'm like, they're not here for you. You're here for your loved one. They're here for your loved one. You can help them. They can help you, but don't, don't demand stuff out of them and don't complain about like the dumbest things. Like I had the most drama with my mom. She became really good friends with another Diane, which people that are on my social media know that it was my mom, Diane, there was other Diane. And then eventually there was other, other Diane because the three Dianes hung out together. <laughs> okay. With with Alzheimer's and dementia, you had three ladies with the same name. Whew, that, was, oh that was confusing for those of us that didn't have broken <laughs> brains. But other Diane, I, my mom's dogs was, was with her the first 18 months that she lived there. Uh -huh. For people that don't have dogs, dogs need structure. They're like toddlers. You, know, yeah. you have to have a, they, and they're, they, dogs don't have long-term memory. They, everything is a pattern. When you, so when you change a dog's pattern, you kind of mess them up for a little bit, but then they establish a new pattern and they move forward and it's okay. But right. they have to have like, you know, have breakfast and dinner at the same time, take walks in the same areas. You know, things got to be similar. My mom's dog didn't get any of that. And the ladies all there in the residence fed her. That poor dog literally was almost double her reasonable body weight. Oh my goodness. Oh, it was awful. She was a poodle. Oh, she goodness. should have weighed 15 pounds. She weighed 28. Oh, my goodness. That's yeah. A I, and, <laughs> and my dad spoiled her something fierce. And then my mom, my mom took clues from the dog. The dog would look at her. And my mom would think she wanted food. Well, maybe the dog just wanted love. You know, they right. don't always want to eat. Right. So I just that she was not she was not super well trained. The, my oldest dog that just recently passed away hated her. So okay. having her at my house was never an enjoyable thing, yeah. So when at, when the two of them were living in the community together, I would just refer to her as Fats because she was so right, happy. right, right. <laughs> but after they they renovated the entire community in the summer of 2018, mm -hmm. and the executive director who has left, and I'm going to harass him when we can actually go back into the communities because I know where he went. He's still local, but so I'm okay. going to show up at the new community and go, Hey, <laughs> you left me. Where are you? Where yeah. are you? Where have you been? <laughs> you know, why, why, I didn't like it when your email popped back. Like it bounced back so fast. It was like, okay. it was funny. Right. 
but when they renovated, so he comes up to me and he goes, well, you know, we, you know, we're doing this renovation and like, "Uh uh-huh. And well, we're going to be getting new carpet. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. So you're asking me to rehome the dog. Well, I'm, I, I'm not really saying that. I'm like, so what do you want? He's like, well, you know, she does have accidents a lot. I'm like, yes, she's a pain in the butt. I understand. Right. He beat around the bush until that bush was deceased. And so <laughs> it was, he never, ever told me I had to get rid of the dog. Uh-huh. Never even politely asked me to rehome her. It was all innuendo. It was so funny. I just love that story because, you know, it's like he knew the benefit of the dog for my mom. Right. And he just, he didn't want to upend the, you know, the situation, but she was, right. she was a problem. And my sister and I had been toying with, is she a, as much of a benefit to mom as she was when they first moved in? My mom would get really frustrated with her, ignore her, forget about her. Uh, so it was being the dog. She would forget about the dog. Yeah. Oh, so okay. it was, we were like, do we get, you know, do we re Homer? Do we, you know, we were, it was nice that the renovation forced the issue. Oh, okay. So after the dog left, the area rug that I had in my mom's room was not pretty. Thanks oh, to the no, dog. Not at I think, all. No, I think we can all figure Probably that didn't one out. Smell good either. So yeah. And so my <laughs> sister had purchased a, an ex. There was a situation where the dog had had an accident. They took the carpet away to clean it, and it never came back. My oh. sister happened to go to IKEA, so she bought another rug. But it happened to be a little bit too small. And then the original one came back. It was like all this. Like I said, I always dealt with like weird drama with my mother. <laughs> uh-huh. And then so after the dog moved out, we put in the new carpet and my mom and other Diane sat there. Now, this carpet was white background with plate sized buttons. My mom was a seamstress. This uh-huh. carpet was super perfect for her. Okay. The two of them discussed this carpet for an hour. I was like, I am about to beat myself over the head (laughs) because they kept saying how nice it was. And then they'd talk about all the colors. And then other Diane would be like, oh, this would be a great wall hanging. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not lights because it was five foot by seven foot. (laughs) So I show up the next week and the carpet's gone. I'm like, what What in the hell? So I asked the director of the memory care. I'm like, did what happened to the carpet? It's like you can't blame the dog. Dog's gone. She's like, What do you mean? I'm like, the carpet on the floor is gone. So when we were done with the visit, all the ladies were, you know, there was a couple men there, but most of them were ladies, all sitting down to have dinner. Uh-huh. We go into other Diane's room. It's rolled up, it's stuck in the corner behind a chair. I'm like, <laughs> so oh, when goodness. when your loved one is in a facility, yes. community, excuse me, I know they hate that term. You have to be part of the team. You know, when they say your mom needs X, Y, Z, and I'm frustrated because I'm like, you couldn't have told me that when I came in the first time. Right. I guess I could have sniped at him and said that, but it's like, okay, whatever. There was a a Rite Aid, like literally two buildings over. It wasn't even, a. I mean, it really wasn't even a quarter of a block. It was, but the challenge was you had to like make multiple U-turns to get in and out of the two two different community areas. Uh Uh-huh. And it's just like, whatever, you know, it's not even worth having this conversation. I'll just just deal with what needs to be handled and move on. You know, it's like, so when, if, if your loved one is in a community, you are part of the team of well, that includes the paid staff. So that was my very long winded story for that one. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Facilities are unique. I, I thank God I did not ever have to put my mother in a facility. Matter of fact, she never had to even go to a rehab. So that was a blessing uh, because uh, having worked in a skilled nursing facility as a licensed clinical social worker, that I know that the best care is not always given in facilities. And I'm not talking about the facility I work in. I'm just saying, I know that, you know, you have to be very careful. You have to monitor. And a lot of times people who are not, and me being a social worker, of course, I know which appropriate and what's not, but those who are not social workers, those who are not, do not know, then it's twice as difficult because they don't know what they should expect. Um, And so that makes it even more of a challenge when you have a loved one in a facility. But I want to say this to the audience, do not hesitate to ask questions. If you have a loved one in a facility and they are reluctant in giving you information And you should be getting that information because you're that person's decision maker, if you will. Then you make sure that they tell you 
and you ask them because you can help you got to hold them accountable and so i wanted to say that to your audience because a lot of times people are scared well i don't want to say anything you know i don't want them to think i'm a pain in the whatever you know what i mean i, I don't want to ask too many questions no that's your loved one and you should ask questions so that's important as well yeah when when you decide to be part of the team yes. that it's not well we're paying you know this right. company you you know, right. this giant pile of money every month because exactly. the staff does not make that much money. Trust me. I, I had several caregivers that were, that I was really close to. Right. Some of them work two and three jobs, so they don't make a lot of money. So be right. kind. Yes. First off, let's pay them more money. But secondly, just know that they don't make a lot of money. And I got more information. I probably have more information than most family members because they, I was always there. I always ask questions, what's going on. And if my mom was causing troubles, not wanting to shower, not wanting to change clothes, I would ask, is she giving you trouble on X or Y? Right. When she was clawing people, you know, yeah. obviously they couldn't like smack her hands back because that's, you know, elder abuse, even though she was abusing the poop out of them. Right, right, You know, right. I would tell them, I'm really sorry. You know, she would, she would be ashamed if she knew what she was doing. And it's just... And she you know, didn't be know. like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. So they knew I was on their side. Right. And I think that really, really helped. Make and I difference. never, I never ever asked or, or I never asked in a way of expectation. Like sometimes I would just show up if we didn't have our rotary meeting on Mondays, I would show up early and say, I thought I'd have lunch with my mom today. Do you guys have an extra lunch for me? Do you want me to go up front and pay for it? Because every time I paid for it, they'd tell me, Oh, go get your money back. I'm like, no, I can afford 10 bucks for lunch. Trust me. It's cheaper than rotary. <laughs> okay. right, and that right. was the rules. But, you know, like one time I showed up and they're like, well, do you want X or Y? I'm like, just bring me whatever's easiest. You know, it's like your job is not to wait on me or to do anything right. for me. And so I, I did everything I could to make their job as easy as possible with my mom, to be as understanding with them as possible with my mom. Right. And I think they really appreciated it. So. Well, you know what? They do appreciate it because I can say this. If you're going into a facility and you have a loved one in there and you're being difficult with the staff, uh, you know, and you expect them to do things above and beyond for your loved one, then that may not happen. So you really want to be careful how you treat them. Um, you know, you want them to be, like you say, a part of the team, because once you have a team concept and they feel like, oh, well, she's good. She, you know, she's with us. Then they will work with you. And so that's really important. Another thing too, if you are uh, have a loved one in a facility um, and you're having trouble seeing that loved one with the COVID and the things the way they are now, they should allow you some type of communication. You need to speak with, at, tell them or let them know that you're gonna contact the ombudsman um, and that's the governing body over facilities. Uh, and so that's important that you do that. Not, you know, you don't wanna, create a problem where you're reporting them, but you also want to let them know, look, I need to know what's going on with my loved one. I need to contact my loved one. I need to have some type of communicate because nine times out of 10, if they have dementia or Alzheimer's and they're in a facility, they're going to, and you're not able to interact with them, there's going to be a significant decline in their cognitive ability. And so you want to be careful of that as well. So that's important to understand too. Yeah. Two things, a quick one. Uh -huh. When I say talk about you're part of the team, treat the staff the way you want them to treat your loved one. That's right. That's, that's an easy rule. That's right. I never I never thought of that wording before. And there's something you said that triggered that. Yes. And then on the the COVID restriction issue. Yeah. I don't know if I'm a little bit out of out in left left field on this one. Yes. And I didn't have to deal with this too much. My mom fell and broke her leg on March eighth. As most people know, California, basically the San Francisco Bay Area shut down just a few days after that. I saw her the, the 12th, the 14th, the 16th, the 17th, we were shut down. They didn't let us in for two weeks. And yeah. then they called me and said, she's not doing really well. We think she'd benefit from a visit from you, which I now know uh, translated as to, uh, yeah, we think she's transitioning. It's time that we better let the family in. And this was early on in the pandemic. I don't know if they've continued doing this. Right. Um, but we did get to see her before she passed away. And right. that was March 31st. So that was right at the beginning of all of this. And I've talked to 
dozens of people who haven't seen their loved ones for weeks or months. It's They're something. doing those window visits. They're doing Zoom calls, which my mom couldn't have handled. I'm not even sure my mom could have handled a traditional phone call. You know? Right, right, <laughs> Maybe. right. Maybe. There, yeah. She didn't have anybody to talk to on a phone phone. So, right. But, you know, if you, if you tried to get her to look at your phone screen, like a FaceTime, it just didn't it just didn't compute. Right. My maternal grandfather, her dad always said, you don't get out of this life alive, which is very true. Right. And I kind of use that as kind of a touchstone guideline for also, you know, we want to have a, we want to give them as much quality of life as possible. And I think somebody, I don't know who, maybe me, I don't know if I could start it, but somebody needs to get with the governing boards, the, the care communities, the nursing homes, the you know state governments, and basically say we need to put into place reasonable. I don't want to say restrictions, but reasonable protocols for visiting. I've there was a gal, and I went back and searched for her. Po- you know, searched for her in Instagram. She posted. She was in Oregon, and she was like, you know, we should be able to go in half an hour at a time. We should have to make an appointment you know, certain, fa- you know, right. Limited number Her of family protocol. members at a time. Yes. Masks all, you know, the whole nine yards. Right. And, you know, but basically preventing family from seeing their loved ones that's other than through the glass or on a screen. I think that's all bad and it's not yeah. a quality. It, it is. And, and the fact that the, the COVID came, nobody was prepared for yeah. it. And so they were just doing what they thought was best to protect your family member. So they was like, okay, we can't allow them in because they might bring the COVID in. But then the staff's coming in and some of them had the COVID. So it just really was a, a trial and error type of situation. But now that we kind of have a handle on it, there definitely needs, a go- needs to be a governing body that puts together some parameters for the facilities. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the states are looking at that. I hope they are. Yeah. Uh, to figure out what they're going to do about it because the nursing homes was a place where the COVID hit hardest. And so I actually was working in a nursing home. Mm. January the 2nd was my last day. Whew. And by the grace of God, yes, I was not there when COVID hit. Thank now, you. That doesn't mean, but I really believe COVID actually was here before that, but it didn't hit hard until what, February, the end of February, around March or something like that, the 1st of March. And so that was a blessing for me to not be in that environment because I was like, Lord, I may have been one of the, you know, victims of it. Yeah. By by the same token, you want to, you know, mention to the ombudsman if you do talk to them and say, hey, what are you, what kind of parameters are you all putting in place for the COVID families? I mean, not the COVID families, the (laughs) nursing home families. You want to make sure that you mention that because even though, you know, it's, it's an issue, it definitely needs to be addressed. And so that's, that's really something I wanted to share also. Yeah. So well, it's also super important because, you know, we're blessed. We're both in California. So, you know, here it is November, whatever the heck date, 27. <laughs> and it's not warm outside, but I could sit outside in a coat and, and right. maybe gloves and, and lean against the glass and talk to my mom. I wouldn't really want that. Now, my almost 103-year-old grandmother is in a board and care home, and they do let you come in. They do want you to wear a mask, which is totally fine. She is profoundly hard of hearing, so when it's just the two of us, I take the mask off because I already have to shout at her. And if I have to shout loud enough to be heard through the mask, it's not going to be a very long visit because then my throat's going to be all scratchy. Right, right, right. And so it's... Do they take your temperature when you go in there? No. They just make you wear a mask. Yeah. And they know I take it off. So, okay. you know, obviously they haven't had a problem. The community my mom was in never had a problem. I don't think they had any, I don't, I don't think they had any outbreaks. I don't, th- I know they didn't have any deaths. Not okay. sure. They thought one person tested positive and I think that was a false positive, but I mean, it was, it was super minor. And that was way back. Um, Cause we cleaned out her room in mid May. So about six weeks after she passed away. Right. So, you know, yeah, yeah, we definitely need because I mean, hopefully we don't. It's like, hopefully we don't have this kind of problem again. But my mom's community did have in the winter of 2018 uh-huh. a huge flu outbreak in the assisted living part of the community, 
which was separate from the memory care, but I mean, not a hundred percent. I don't know if they shared ventilation or not. And so there was always warning signs on the door, like don't come in if you don't feel good, be warned right. that this is a problem and you might go homesick. Right. And they, it was so bad. They had to stop serving meals in the dining room. Now this is on the assisted living side and serve every, you know, bring everybody's meals to the to their apartments. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I, I think they had kind of like, that was kind of maybe a small test run for what to do. Cause uh -huh. I know they did that with the COVID. I don't know what they're doing now. Okay. I was there the day before Halloween to deliver some goodies for the residents and to okay. see the people I hadn't seen since May. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so they let me in and I did have a mask and I did interact with the guests. And the one thing that I thought was dumb is the square dining tables all had X's of plexiglass, probably at least three feet tall. And I'm like, these people don't go anywhere. You know, like, what are you protecting them from? It's just like so they, they so they could sit at the table and they had the plexiglass in front of them. Yeah, so the plexiglass divided the table into four pie pieces, basically. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought that was a little a little too much, but. I didn't say anything because I thought, well, one, the staff didn't have a choice. Right. You know, even the directors probably didn't have a choice. So I'm like, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to mention that I think this is really stupid. <laughs> well, you know, they may have done it because uh, licensing may have required at that point for them to either do that or have the patients eat in their rooms. And so a lot of them probably were used to going out because they have a big community room in most of those facilities where they can gather, they can watch TV, they can play bingo, they can play games and that type of thing. And then all of a sudden you just stop that. That affects them even more so. And so they had to probably take some measures that were put in place to be proactive, if you will, um, yep. to protect the patients. See, I hadn't even thought of that. And especially yeah. with people with advanced stages of Alzheimer's and dementia, you right. don't want them eating in their rooms alone. You don't want them in their rooms all the time yeah. by themselves Isolation anyway. Isolation is, cr is crucial, is, is detrimental to them. Isolation is detrimental to those who have dementia or Alzheimer's, yes. Definitely. It's not great for any of us, but it's definitely bad for them. Right, So right. before we like yak on about everything but Caregiver yeah. Chronicles, tell yeah. us exact, tell, tell me all about Caregiver Chronicles. Okay. Regular listeners have heard what I have, you know, I got a little you know, minute and a half description, so right. let's flesh that out. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen if you don't mind. Certainly. And I so. can show you a little bit about Caregiver Chronicles, okay? And we're going to describe it for those that are just listening to the audio. Okay, give me just one second here. Not a problem. There they are. Make sure I find my glasses. <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can get it up. You know, I'm learning this every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different learning experience with the with the uh, sharing of the screen and that type of thing. So now, you did you see it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So Caregiver Chronicles um, is an eight-week, step-by-step, walk-through uh, online course on caregiving, caretaking, and the overseeing process of your loved one. Um, the courses cover all areas of caregiving, from the onset of your loved one's illness until they recover from that illness or until they transition home to be with the Lord. Okay, and so let me tell you about Caregiver Chronicles and why it was developed because I realized that after mom's illness, I was giving uh, information out and I knew every aspect of care caregiving. And then when we went into the COVID, I was like, okay, so I need to pull this together so that I can really help people because it's really important. And there are going to be many people who need this service, who need to know what to do. And so it covers all aspects of caregiving. And then let me uh, go to the next slide, if I may. And this is these are the courses that are available. What is a caregiver? Educating yourself on the diagnosis, caring for a sick loved one, observing your loved one's religious belief, a healthy lifestyle, navigating the medical professionals, understanding medication, legal matters, the decision maker, insurance like Medicare, Medi-Cal, HMOs, PPOs, community resources, durable medical equipment like wheelchairs, walkers, etc. cetera, uh, when a caregiver is needed, finding a caregiver, placement in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility, family dynamics, 
challenges and conflict, which is always a part of caregiving as well, home health, hospice, and planning for your loved one's transition. So those are the courses that are available and they are ready at this time uh, for you if you're interested. Um, And then these are the various options that we have for you to register for the courses. You, uh, for option one, you would have 16, all 16 classes plus three bonus courses. So all of the courses that I just mentioned, they are included in the 19 courses that you would get. You would get six private consultations from me. You would be invited to a weekly live group. Um, let me see if I can move up the, our picture here. I think, we, yeah. Um, you would be invited to a weekly live group and you would also be invited to a private Facebook group where we would have private discussions about areas that you need help with. Option two consists of eight classes, four private consultations, weekly live group, and also invite to the private Facebook group. And then there's option three, and that consists of one class, two private consultations, and the weekly live group. And then option four, which is two private consultations and the weekly live group. Now, I didn't, I'm going to, when I finish, I'm going to show you a flyer on uh, tonight's Friday Night Live because tonight, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be paying homage to caregivers. Um, And so we want to make you aware of that as well because we're on every Friday uh, with the recording or with the live show. So if you have information, you want more information or uh, you want to register for the courses, you can always visit our website at www.caregiverchronicles247.com. You can also email us at caregiverchronicles247 at gmail.com. Or you can schedule a free private consultation by uh, clicking on the uh, rebrandly G3N1BRO. Those That's the way to get a schedule a private consultation. And if you can't write that down, you can always go to the website. All of this information is there. And you can also visit our YouTube channel at Caregiver Chronicles 24-7. Um, and so I want to just make this available to you. Um, we are available 24-7 to help you. Um, many, many times when you become a caregiver, you don't know what to do. And so I have lived it and I'm prepared to walk you through it and help you get through it. And I will help you develop your Caregiver Chronicles. So now I want to share one other uh, screen, if I may. Definitely. And all those links are in the show notes. So you can oh, they just are? scroll okay. down and click on them. Okay. All right. So let me just share the flyer for tonight so you can uh, have access to that. If you give me just one second. Certainly. And I was on one of the lives, I think back in yeah. August. Yeah. Time does not seem to have any constraints or constructs anymore. And it was a lot of fun. So I definitely suggest you tune into that. Even right, if you just right. watch, you can participate. What the heck? We're not going anyplace on Friday nights anymore anyway. Right. <laughs> and you know what? Not really. So I, that's why I said this would be a good Friday night because most people, they should be in their environment, in their homes this weekend. And you know what? I can't really get that flyer. Oh, it's in the downloads. That's why. Okay, here we go. Give me just one second and I'll show it to you. And then we can move on. I want to make sure I don't leave anything out because it's important that you know that there is a resource for you. If you are a caregiver, there is help and guidance and direction for you. So I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. And I want to thank you too, Jennifer, for allowing me to come on and share this information. Um, Definitely. It's nice to have somebody you can ask questions of, well, your specific question to a person who's been there, done that. I popped in on the caregiver Facebook pages. And sometimes people get 60, 70, 200 responses. And it's like, I'm a reader and I'm not going through all of that. And sometimes it's just like, oh, I don't have an answer, but I'm pulling for you or I'm praying for you. And it's like, well, that's just useless. You know, if I saw 200 responses, I'd think I'd have probably 10 good pieces of information. And that's not always the case because, you know, we're just trying to help each other, but Sometimes that's the blind leading the blind. So I I see a huge value in having somebody in your corner. Yes. And this is a very affordable way to do that. Yes, this is very important. And so here's the flyer for Caregiver Chronicles tonight. Um, It's pretty large here on the screen. Let me make it a little smaller so you can see it. And uh, let's see, let's go to 75. Okay. So this is the flyer. 
And uh, we'll be talking about just paying homage to caregivers right now. We know that there are many people who are caregivers and we're having an evening of gratitude for caregivers. And so we have uh, several guests um, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Marino is a, um, he is a senior manager with the Alzheimer's Association. And then uh, Dr. Diaz is a geriatric doctor from USC. Uh, she does USC Alzheimer's disease research. And Mr. Marino, his, his mother, he's also caregiver for his mother at this time. And then uh, the gentleman here, Elder Michael Jackson is going to be, uh, well, he was a former caregiver and he's also going to talk about and share his experience tonight. So uh, his wife uh, succumbed to her illness uh, recently. So we're gonna share that tonight as well. So I hope you can join us. Um, the Zoom information is on the screen. If you're interested, please join in. We like to have an open dialogue. It's an open forum. It's Caregiver Chronicles, Ask Dr. Yvette Anything. And we just wanna share information because information is vital. And mm -hmm. if we don't talk about it, then we'll never get to where we need to be in life. So I, I thank you for allowing me to share with, the, with everyone today. You're welcome. Now is the Zoom link the same every week? It's the same every week. Okay. And you can also I will share call that in all the show notes. Yes. Because we're not going to hit, people won't hear this recording until after tonight, obviously. Yes. I can be quick, but I'm not that quick. <laughs> right. So I'm, yeah, but every, the same. every Friday without fail. And I do share the flyers on a lot of my social media, but I will share yes. the Zoom link in the show notes going forward so okay. that you guys can just pop in whenever you got a free Friday night. Yes. And you don't even have to, part you could just listen, which is also good. I think on Christmas and New Year's, we're going to be not, we're not going to record because those are all Fridays. And I think people will want to spend time with their loved one. But the, I just want to mention too, the password for the Zoom, it's case sensitive. So it's Z, capital Z and a small D and then one, one and capital V and capital N. So that particular link uh, that particular password needs its case sensitive for the, those who are listening in. Okay. Okay. And that'll be in the show notes, hot links in the show notes. Ugh. <laughs> Tongue is trying to tie itself in a knot. So is there yes. any last information you want to share with the audience before no, I, let I go and get ready for another zoom call? <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'll be on zoom in a couple of hours, but if you want to join us uh, at any Friday, please do so. The only Friday, as I said, will be Christmas and new year's. We will not be, New Year's Day, we will not be recording those days, but other than that, we should be on every Friday. Um, yeah, it's a great show. It's, it allows us to share information. It allows me to reach people that, that know that there's someone out there to help them. Um, you know, it, it's important to know that you can reach out. And please don't hesitate to ask a question. Say something. If you need help, ask for it because help is available and we're available to help you. God bless you all. Thank you for allowing me to join you tonight, Jennifer. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.